Uh, good, good evening, good afternoon. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? Yeah. Right, just want to firstly say that it, it really is an absolute pleasure, delight to be here. I am truly a London GP. I trained uh, at Charing Cross, that's when I first met uh, Michelle. Uh, I've no, only known London, Northwest London, as a GP. I've been in the same practice for 23 years from the day I became a GP, so uh, I'm very much rooted in the London experience. Today I'm going to actually just be talking about uh, some of the uh, issues that are affecting all of us and some of the thinking uh, at GPC on how we actually address the challenges in front of us. So I think it's probably worthwhile just framing where we are as GPs, where general practice is uh, in the current uh, context, uh, the outside context. Uh, and the first, we all know that we are actually uh, having increasing demographic demands uh, on our work as GPs, on our practices. We know that the population is uh, aging. In fact, 29% have long-term conditions, uh, and within a 10-year time span, there'll be a million more patients with three or more long-term conditions. They make up 50% of the consultations with GPs. Uh, and of course, you know, if you then bring into the mix London, there's this huge demographic demand of the patients that we look after, the ethnically diverse, the non-English speaking, the mobile, uh, population we look after, there are all sorts of additional deprivation indices that don't actually feature in the sort of formulae that actually fund our practices. On top of that, we're also uh, actually having pressure from the other side as well, not just the increases uh, in demand in primary care, in the population, in the community, but also in terms of the movement of care that's moving out of our hospitals. This will be familiar to all of us on a daily basis. You know, 10 years ago, chronic disease management was, was, was actually, to a large degree, managed also in hospitals. It's now in its entirety in our own uh, GP surgeries. Um, we've seen the ending of di routine diabetic clinics, dermatology clinics, and one can go on. We know that patients are being discharged earlier. We know that we've had an expansion of daycare surgery. Patients don't go back for their post-operative follow-ups in, in hospital. Uh, there's reduced outpatient follow-up. All of those patients don't just vanish. They're actually coming into our surgeries. It's our nurses that remove the sutures. It's we who actually see them when they've actually had a problem after an operation last week. And the trouble with all this work is it's not quantified. We ab absorb it without actually being funded or resourced for what has been an, an, an unarguable uh, exponential increase in what we're actually doing uh, daily. Investigations, you know, it's commonplace. We get letters on a daily basis where we do investigations that were previously done as part of a routine outpatient follow-up and so forth. So there really is this pressure from both ends for us. And of course, in London, a very explicit strategy to move care out of hospital. We're all going through that transformation. Uh, and of course, we will see fewer hospitals in London as part of that strategy. So we're very mindful that general practice in London is actually very much uh, being asked to do a, a lot of work from both sides. And you know, whilst we're really being, uh, not just asked, but whilst we're delivering this exponential uh, uh, level of, of care, um, it's bizarre, isn't it, that we actually have a workforce that has actually been, th th where the workforce has actually, you know, um, the strategy has been actually the opposite. You know, GPs uh, constituted about 35% of the UK workforce back in 1995. It's now dropped to just over 25%, the total opposite to the pattern of care that we've seen emerging. This just again shows another graph, very similarly, seeing, you've seen actually hospital consultant numbers rocket in this period of time, whilst GP numbers have actually plateaued. It just doesn't fit with the way care is being managed. The Centre of Workforce Intelligence, nothing to do with the BMA, an independent body that looks at workforce needs, themselves have actually stated that the GP workforce is under considerable strain. It's just insufficient in its capacity to meet future patient needs. They've actually quoted well beyond the college's 10,000 GPs. They actually think there's a need for far more GPs to actually meet the challenges in the next uh, 20 years. So not on top, on top of all of that, we're also under-resourced. You know, spending on GP services from 2006 to 2011 was just 10%. 
compared to a 42% increase in funding to hospital services. We all know this from our day-to-day -day reality. Uh, this graph you'll be perhaps familiar with, which again shows that whilst general practice received 10% of the overall slice of the NHS budget, we're now only on 7.47%. That's only about 2.5% to the NHS budget, but that's really about a quarter of our resources that's actually been removed, a quarter of resources from general practice. So that, in a way, you know, leads to no surprises that GPs at large feel overworked uh, and lacking in morale. You know, the Department of Health uh, commissioned a work-life survey. They, they, they do this uh, uh, annually or every couple of years. And the last one was just a few months ago in August 2013, which showed the lowest levels of job satisfaction since 2004, the highest levels of stress amongst GPs since the survey be uh, series began, and a substantial increase in numbers of GPs intending to retire. This was, of course, mirrored in our own survey. GPC conducted a survey back in September. Many of you will have completed it, which showed similar. But it also showed that GPs were disengaging with other wider issues. One in two GPs were just less engaged with their CCG. They may turn up to meetings, but they weren't really participating. And this, I think, should concern us all. The government's own survey, by the way, although it was commissioned, doesn't feature on any of their websites. They chose not to actually advertise those findings, but it's actually available on, on Google. So, so, so today's political context, where are we? I mean, the first thing to say, we all know, there is actually no new money, far from it. In fact, we're being asked to save 30 billion pounds by 2020. Having said that, perhaps the one bit of uh, slight uh, good news or partial good news were the contract changes that we negotiated for 2014-15. We hope that that will make some difference to GPs in reducing the bureaucracy, in actually giving them more space to actually provide personalized care. And we hope that will be noticeable from April 2014. But of course, the contract changes aren't going to address those bigger issues that I was describing earlier, because the workload demands over and above the contract on GP practices just relentlessly continues to increase. We're also, from April onwards, going to be experiencing the realities of uh, the equitable funding changes, you know, where over seven years, certainly initially for GMS practices and thereafter for PMS, we're going to see an equalization of funding to, to the same pounds per head. Now, that's going to you know, significantly have an effect on many practices who will be losing money, but equally, uh, there'll be perhaps just over half of practices that will be gaining. And we need to factor that in to how we plan to the future. Future. A huge expectation, you know this already, in looking at general practice in terms of standardization of care, standardization of quality of what we can expect between different GP practices. And that actually links into the equitable funding in terms of the government's thinking. We all know that we're being scrutinized like ne never before. In fact, the triple whammy of actually having the sort of area team assurance framework, that, 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 that whole dimension, we're being scrutinized by CQC and the new visits from April will, will be actually looking at the quality of care we provide. And then there's, of course, a lot of the CCG stuff where we have bar graphs of, of how we actually refer or don't refer or prescribe, etc. We've got the Prime Minister's Challenge Fund. The deadline uh, is tomorrow, which will uh, signal for many, many practices uh, a seven-day opening uh, uh, initiative. We've got the Urgent Care Review by Bruce Keogh, which will uh, uh, determine the sort of whole urgent care agenda over seven days and how general practice uh, actually uh, uh, addresses those challenges. And of course, we've got Monitor and the whole competition agenda uh, that's very much a reality. So in that sort of context of competition, you know, AQP is no longer a theory. It hasn't been for a while. It's a reality. Enhanced services now, we all know, are increasingly being put out to tender. Uh, with the advent of local uh, authorities actually commissioning many of our enhanced services, they've known no nothing else. That's the way they commission. They commission by putting things out to tender. This is a reality. We've seen sexual health services up and down the country actually moving out of GP surgeries or rather being put out to tender to others to provide. And one of the real difficulties for GP practices, we're small units, it's, it's quite difficult to compete with those commercial providers who have the advantage of size, they have business acumen, they can take risk, loss leading contracts, we just can't do those sorts of things. 
We have to compete with foundation trusts. I was at a dinner last night where uh, two GPs were actually employed by the Whittington Hospital to provide general practice services. So, you know, this isn't theory. This is actually something that we need to be mindful of. The other problem for us as GPs is, of course, our idea of competition is competing with providing quality, whereas many of the other commercial organizations are, are very much wanting to provide access, uh, actually have perhaps nurses replacing doctors, lower grade triage, uh, and of course that becomes a difficulty because our competition is going to be more expensive because it's on quality. Huge opportunity costs in tendering, competing, and a new dimension of, of, of competition is around the government's wish to actually increase the value of patients. You know, one of the uh, changes around the contract is patients will be worth, in, our, in terms of core funding, around 78 pounds. They're worth more than the 65 pounds we started off with last year. There's also the abolishing of, of practice boundaries, where the government wants practices to actually compete for patients beyond a list size within a local area. We need to be mindful of that whole sp uh, spectre. And of course, we know that the challenges of competition are greater the smaller the unit. So in planning for the future, first of all, no one, none of us, are actually immune from these external pressures and threats. We know that the vulnerability increases the smaller the unit. Uh, we're particularly vulnerable for those practices that we're losing money from April onwards and PMS losing practices, those that have been highly funded. And this isn't actually about practices alone. This actually affects all of us, whether you're a partner, a sessional GP, a freelance doctor, because you know, if practices make staff redundant, if we're working within different environments, different employment uh, uh, arrangements, this will affect the GP workforce at large. And of course, we've got this added dimension of London that often is forgotten in our national negotiations. We have larger numbers of small practices, uh, larger numbers of, of, of premises that are just not uh, up to current standards. We have higher numbers of eth ethnic doctors, uh, and those have implications in terms of the, some of the statistics that come out of performance management uh, for right or wrong. There's large numbers of salaried and freelance GPs. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of demographics that just isn't catered for in terms of the way we're funded. So in terms of securing our future, moving into what we can do about this, this, this framed landscape, well, of course, the first is uh, that we are in, a, in an environment in the future of, of survival of the fittest. We know that as, as you get larger at scale, there are economies. It improves our ability to compete. We can share opportunity costs. You know, putting out a tender that's going to cost 50 to 100K would be impossible at a single or two practice level. It actually just mean, may mean a little bit of chipping in when you actually uh, uh, you know, make that into sort of 30 or 40 practices and become achievable. Uh, there's financial risk and security numbers that you can actually share. But in fact, a lot of this talk about survival of the fittest is around sort of the language of, well, if we don't do this, you know, Virgin will take us over. I hear this all the time. But wouldn't it be good if we didn't talk about that climate of threat and actually looked at working together in a positive light and actually talk about new opportunities of practices working together, of actually providing new and expanded services, looking at new income streams that may actually protect us from some of the vagaries around the national contract uh, uh, funding streams about new professional development roles, doctors wanting to become medical directors, clinical leaders, uh, and new opportunities uh, in, in our careers. Peer support, education, managing workload and risk, all of these are actually possible with working together. But I actually want to introduce a third dimension about why working together is important. And I say this because of the London effect, having spent all of my time uh, in London, seeing what the way GPs are, how hard they work, and that's about looking after our own. Actually supporting the disadvantaged, through, often through no fault of their own, very much known to the LMCs around here, around, uh, around the tables. Supporting smaller practices, giving them a lifeline by actually working together, and ultimately maximizing the potential of what is clearly an inadequate GP workforce. Those statistics I showed you earlier, there aren't enough of us. The last thing you want is for GPs to have burnout and to actually leave the profession, especially in London, uh, when, we, when we can ill afford to. So really, there are a lot of GPs. There are a lot of practices that are weak. They are disadvantaged for all sorts of reasons. 
Many are actually in inadequate premises. They're locked in. You, you hear about, I heard about it last, last night at a meeting, you know, the end of terrorist premises. But these GPs have no option. They have no other opportunity to actually move elsewhere, even though they actually want to. Most of them will be CQC vulnerable, again, through no fault of their own. Many are isolated. Many have challenging demographics that just aren't catered for by the way we fund our practices. Many are locked at 65 pounds per head, trying to actually provide the same range of services as a practice with a, 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 three times that figure, who actually have three nurse practitioners, two F2 doctors, two GP registrars, and so forth. You know, it, it isn't a fair comparison. We need to ensure that everyone's opportunities are equal or equitable. Many have actually suffered over decades with poor support, poor, poor development. They've actually been written off in terms of, of, of being given support. Uh, many try and survive with s low staffing levels, poor management, and in fact, through no fault of their own, some of them just aren't politically savvy, but they suffer. And if you've actually looked at any of those CQC inspection reports, if any of you have actually read through them, you'd actually see they're mostly around premises, organization, uh, things that are nothing to do with the quality of care that those individual GPs provide, yet they're actually caught in that whole tarring of poor performance. And that's one of the opportunities, I believe, as we work together to try and support each other. Uh, and I actually met a, 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 a manager, practice manager in Yorkshire, where they've set up a federation. One of their key features was actually to support practices prior to, to, to um, for, for one practice to support another uh, it, before a CQC inspection. So that just, I think, you know, just does highlight the potential of good there. Well, of course, you can collaborate in different ways. Um, you could actually just collaborate at the level of the GP services we provide, G GMS, PMS. You could collaborate to provide new models of care, new provider units, uh, and, and that's more ambitious, and that's happening up and down the country. But in doing all of this, of course, what we don't want is to actually have tears and, and upset and discord, and we need to guard against that. So if we actually just start with something very simple at the contracts we all hold, the GPMS contracts. You know, in 2004, when we, got, uh, when we ended the Red Book, there were huge opportunities for collaboration that none of us really properly exploited, maybe some of us, but it, it's been a hugely, hugely unexploited area. Because actually, even today, without any extra effort, it's possible to actually share human resources, cross-cover training. How many practices do that? Very, very few. We can subcontract. If you don't have the ability to provide a certain enhanced service, the current contract allows it in a way the Red Book never did. With the Red Book, you actually show that you actually paid for your own staff to work in your own practices. It's, it's, it's not difficult to bulk purchase, to have back office functions. We don't really do it. Um, even when you look at extended hours, we've negotiated from April the 1st that, that you can actually provide extended hours across networks of practices. That isn't part of the current regulations, but that will be in April onwards, and we hope practices will take advantage of that in being able to widen their access by actually working together and sharing patients who, who they can see. In many ways, this goes back to when I uh, uh, first became a GP, when we actually shared in those Saturday morning rotors and out-of-hours rotors with five or six practices around so it's, in a way, it's going back to that thinking. You know, the Christmas closing problem could be solved if we were actually working together. It would need some IT infrastructure to support it, but we could actually offer our patients access to, to, to working hours within our contract requirements. You know, CQC registration, I've described that before, but I haven't met many practices that have actually systematically across an area tackled this uh, collaboratively. Um, I'll go on to the next. So structural options for new provider models. I'm not going to run through this. You've actually been in workshops, but you're aware there are a range of ways in which practices can work together. They can work together informally. You can have formal new legal structures, a whole list of them. And I know you've attended workshops on this, but the crucial point is you do need expert legal advice if you're going down those formal routes. In terms of principles, well, you know, um, I think it's important if we're going to be working together in any shape or form to actually ask ourselves in a local uh, area what the purpose is, because form will follow function. But crucially, there needs to be a shared vision. Uh, you need to ensure there's equity of opportunity. You don't want practices to be corralled into something because they feel, gosh, I have to. You know, that's not going to be the, the ingredients of a successful collaborative venture. 
In all of this, we must preserve the essence and success of general practice. That's why we get those good satisfaction ratings from our patients. That's why our patients are our, are our strongest political allies. And in all of this, we don't want to become so impersonal that it's at the detriment of that, 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 that essence of general practice. And of course, whatever we do needs to benefit patients. You know, I've, I've had patients register with our practice from many other practices that have actually become very, very shiny and, and, and large, and, and, and many patients do complain, and we know that, that what they really want, and we know that the satisfaction ratings amongst patients is highest amongst small practices. So we need to retain that smallness whilst we get bigger. I said earlier, we must, in setting these systems up, support the weakest and disadvantaged. We want to make the most of the potential of our, our entire GP workforce in London, and we need to create an environment of synergy. This isn't about takeovers, looking at some small practice to actually, in a predatory sense, sort of get into, into a larger fold. This is about proper equal partnerships and valuing each other and actually providing true contractual and career developmental opportunities. There are many salaried GPs who, who really would want, or sessional GPs, who really have their full part that they can play uh, in these arrangements. Now, of course, there are risks and challenges. You know, the risk of uh, losing autonomy, uh, differences in opinions and philosophies, probably one of the real challenges, and we'll have to see how this pans out, are our practices actually willing to share historic unequal resources in, 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 in actually developing a collaborative approach? Trust, collective ethos, whole issues about legal and, and, and other liabilities around the actions of other practices you're aligned with, setting up cost, time, so it is a challenge. Having said all of that, we know it can happen, it does happen. There are many, many fine examples, both in London, outside London, where GPs have succeeded in working together uh, effectively. And these are just a few examples uh, which cover the range of um, uh, structural models that can occur, whether it's a limited liability partnership, uh, or, or for that matter, not-for-profit community interest. So there are models out there we can actually look at, uh, and we know that they, they are in, in existence, they do work. So in making it happen, the most important thing for all of us is we can't afford the ostrich uh, approach. We do have to be cognizant of the world outside, the political context, and the changes that are actually confronting us. We need to be talking within our practices and outside our practices. They need to be part and parcel of our practice meetings. We need to address the premises constraints that prevent general practice from actually delivering our current needs let alone the future needs. And I'm, I know that in London there's very much a mood and a commitment from the area team to support that process, and that's great. The LMC is fundamental in this. This is why today's meeting is fantastic, it's important. London-wide are very much, I'd say, ahead of the curve and they're crucial in actually being part of this process. CCGs have a hugely important part to play. You know, that, that uh, workload that I mentioned earlier that's moving into our surgeries from hospitals, there's nothing actually that prevents changing the commissioning arrangements and levers so that resources follow the changing pattern of care. We just need to get more skilled as clinicians in enabling that to happen. And of course, we need the support of our area teams and learning from others uh, 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 because there's no point actually trying to reinvent the wheel. We've actually produced guidance as GPC. We've uh, produced, I, I have to say, some very easy to read guidance. I would really uh, recommend that you look on our website at guidance on collaborative GP alliances and federations. Very you know, easy to understand English with case studies and practical steps how you can actually you know, make this move. Also guidance on how to share uh, and employ staff between different practices, including some of the legal uh, um, uh, context. We're launching a survey, I think it's going out tonight, so you'll probably receive it in your inboxes, on the landscape of collaboration, what GPs are looking for, what support they may want from GPC, uh, and that, please watch out for it and please do fill it in. At a national level, GPC has also uh, tried to look at defining what we think should be uh, the future of general practice. We produced a document last year, Developing General Practice Today, providing healthcare solutions uh, for the future. So that is uh, available on our website. I would again uh, argue and suggest that you should look at it. We put a lot of thought into it. Michelle helped us uh, actually uh, uh, finalize the sort of final draft. 
Uh, and in fact, just to talk about collaboration, it goes beyond GP practices, doesn't it? Because collaboration is wider than GPs working together. It is about integrated care built around the practice. It's about community healthcare teams, GPs collaborating with community staff, community nursing, and having a primary healthcare team that transcends that artificial barrier between our practices and our patients who actually reside outside our practices. Uh, and also, there's enormous scope around also building some, uh, some alliances with our community pharmacists as part of a whole system, a demand management approach. But it's also about collaborating with our secondary care colleagues because one of the things we all face on a day-to-day -day basis is that enormous hassle, that, that, that the wasted time in our consultations around the primary secondary care interface issues. And when you actually speak to a lot of our hospital colleagues, they don't actually like what's happening either. I asked a consultant the other day, why is it that every patient who doesn't turn up is automatically discharged and, and, and comes to see me for a re-referral? I could give lots of other examples. They don't like it either. We do need to find ways of cutting through all of that. And, and collaboration being a true spirit of clinicians uh, uh, in secondary care, which, which who should also move out in the community, working with us within a community-based approach. So turning solutions into reality is so much for good ideas. There's no doubt that as I started at the beginning, we have to find more funding that comes into general practice, that comes into primary care. Uh, and, and, and the college have been saying it, and we very much support the fact that there has to be more, more funding. Not, not, not as some sort of theoretical ideology, but because it makes sense, because it actually will achieve the transformation we're looking for. There has to be a workforce strategy uh, that actually today makes it clear that we do need and we do uh, recruit more GPs. We do retain those that are actually within our workforce. But also, actually, there's a, a real uh, potential for actually increasing the number of returners uh, back to work. Vicky's in the audience. She's done a lot of work on this. So we do need to look at every avenue to maximize the workforce. Premises, you know, I've mentioned this before, woefully inadequate. It's, it's absolutely unsustainable. We can't continue to provide general practice, let alone anything else, with the infrastructure we've got. And it's not actually, as I'm sure you'd all agree, about going back to the red book and getting each practice to get a bit more money to actually just, you know, put a little bit of an, an extension at the back of their surgery. This is about something much more imaginative. It is about networks. It is about working together, getting hubs that we can all make use of collectively uh, to actually improve and expand the services that GP practices provide in, within a community setting. And it is also about patients. It's about actually a partnership with our patients to collectively uh, take hold of trying to make the most of what we can provide and actually take responsibility uh, uh, for, uh, as partners in what is an overstretched budget and overstretched workload for all of us uh, as part of a wider demand management and self-care agenda. Now, changing external mindsets, this is one of the biggest difficulties for us as GPs because that's a problem uh, at a local and national level. And this has been probably one of the real uh, you know, eye-openers for me in, in chairing GPC when, when we've actually gone to government. Because actually, all this stuff you hear about um, all this stuff you hear about four-hour waits and and waits is all about just not enough casualty doctors. And so the solution is we need more to actually solve those pressures. But what about us as GPs? You know, one week, two week waits to see a GP practice, it's never about not enough GPs. The media simply talks about, oh, it's a receptionist that wasn't helpful. Uh, and actually the GPs aren't working hard enough. We've got to actually get it across that we also are under crisis. We need more of us. You know, investing in hospitals is all about investing in care and services. That's how the politicians speak. And yet, whenever I've actually talked to government around investing in general practice, it's all about GP pay. How can we actually pay GPs more? They earn enough. So there is something about actually arguing the case for investment in general practice services in what we actually provide that actually goes beyond the pay argument. I am now, these are the last few slides, some of you have seen them before, but it's really good to, I think, highlight, so uh, I, I've nearly finished. You know, just to say that um, whilst we're told repeatedly that we're profligate, we spend so much, we've got to save so much, the truth is, even today, in the UK, we are the second lowest spender in an in international comparison of OECD countries uh, uh, as, as looked at by the Commonwealth Fund, which is where these slides come from. We should be very proud that our system of general practice is accessible to the most needy. You know, in fact, 
the UK had the lowest numbers of patients who didn't actually attend an appointment or didn't collect a prescription because of cost, whereas in all of these other countries, large numbers of GPs just don't go to see their doctor or don't go to, a, to an outpatient appointment or don't actually get an investigation because they have to pay for it. And I think it's a salutary lesson uh, when we actually have a discussion on co-payments. We are accessible. We should be proud of it. Access to a doctor or nurse, you know, we're told how difficult it is to see, for, for patients to see doctors, or GPs rather. Well, when you look at us compared to the rest of the developed world, it was actually, the, the Commonwealth Fund showed that we were the easiest uh, GPs where patients could actually get a same or next day appointment. Far more difficult uh, in, in the USA. So we actually are extremely accessible. Equally, you'd, if you looked at the headlines, you'd actually believe that everyone's turning up to A&E because they don't have out-of-hours care. Well, when the Commonwealth Fund looked at this, in actual fact, patients reported uh, or fewer patients attended casualty in the UK than in any of the other countries because of deficiencies in out-of-hours. And they reported that the UK had the best system of out-of-hours. Last two. Um, Chronic disease, personalised care, this is the big thing from April onwards, as if we didn't do it already. Again, you look at the Commonwealth Fund, UK GPs provide the highest level of personalised care for chronic conditions with care plans in a way that is almost unheard of in, in other nations. Performance management, I mentioned earlier. You know, we actually review uh, our, our patients and audit the care we provide. Again, we tower above the sort of uh, work that GPs do in other parts of, uh, of the world. And about performance management, you know, we are performance managed more than anyone else. Just look at this graph. We really are performance managed in a way that no one else in these other European nations are performance managed against targets. Uh, and also in terms of receiving data, comparing ourselves to others. In these other countries, there isn't actually that comparison that goes on. So finally, the very final slide, just to say that I think we should all stand tall and feel very proud of the care we provide and actually you know, d recognize that we do provide an amazing job on a daily basis. I don't think the patients out there, the public out there on the street know that whilst, whilst, whilst 21 million patients will attend casualty in a year, 340 million patients will have attended a GP surgery in a year. That isn't understood outside. I don't think it's understood outside that whilst you actually add in everything to our budgets, from our global sum, COAF, enhanced services, everything, dispensing, it's about £130 per head per year for unlimited care, including home visits, travel vaccinations, health promotion, and yet you'll pay £200 for a single outpatient appointment when a patient attends a hospital clinic. So investing in general practice makes sense. It makes sense because we're cost effective. A small increase in the budget for general practice will transform our ability to provide care. That's the key message we need to get across locally in London, nationally, developing general practice today, providing healthcare solutions uh, for the future. Thank you very, very much for listening.